So you may have noticed that there's no cars in my garage. Where the heck is the Type R and what are we buying next? All right, let's try this video again. I literally just went through this whole video and realized that my microphones were turned off. So yeah, I wanted to make an update video today, guys. Um, it's been a couple of weeks since I've updated you guys on the Civic Type R. I wanna talk about where it is, what we have coming in the future, and what it's like to actually try to purchase a GTR. I wanna go over things you should look for if you're looking on buying a used GTR. And I wanna talk about the future of this channel because I, I know that's important to a lot of people, including myself. Number one, the Civic Type R is not gone. It's actually at Stratton Motor Cars right now. We are gonna get the entire car vinyl wrapped. I will reveal the color in a future video. So I'm currently working on filming that. Um, I want to kind of make like a cinematic edit, you know, kind of like I did when we were installing the bolt-ons on the car because I just I just enjoy doing cinematic edits. It's a lot of fun. It gives me practice. You know, they're not doing it for free. I am paying them, but they were highly recommended to me by multiple people. They're located in Phoenix. So if you want to get your car wrapped, you should hit them up. You know, I'll, I'll have more information about them in future videos. But also, if you watched my previous video, we installed the flex fuel kit onto the Civic Type R. And in that video, I mentioned that my tuner told me not to run any E85 in my car until I get the Honda data fuel system upgrade. Main reason being is not that the cars can't run any ethanol in them. It's because the 2019 Type R's have a recall on the fuel pump and the recall is pretty big. Basically, people are driving around and their cars are shutting off and then they have to call a tow truck. Adding an extra stress to that with the ethanol just is gonna make it happen even quicker. And so my car is kind of in this weird place. My car falls within the dates of the recall, but when I run my VIN number, no recall pops up. And I was reading in the forums the other day, there's a bunch of people whose VIN numbers didn't produce a recall, but in fact, their fuel pumps failed. So Stratton Motor Cars is also installing the fuel system for me. And if you guys aren't familiar with the Honda fuel system, I will link to a video in the description below where I go over it. But essentially it's the low pressure fuel pump, the high pressure fuel pump, and all the injectors. This Honda fuel system allows a full bolt-on car to go 450 horsepower to the wheels on ethanol, which is crazy. And then I believe if you go like 91 or 93 octane, you can get about 420 horsepower uh, to the wheels. If not, you know, maybe a little bit less, but you definitely go above and beyond the 400 wheel horsepower limit that we were once hitting before the fuel upgrade. I was originally going to do an install video on the Honda Data fuel system. A couple of reasons why I didn't. Number one, when I received the fuel system, it was 117 degrees outside and my garage is not air conditioned. I can't think correctly when I'm that hot and I would not want to mess it up because it's an expensive fuel system. They're about $2,800. Number two is in the manual for the Honda Data fuel system, it tells you if you get any dirt in the fuel system at all, and that fuel system bails, Honda Data will void the warranty. And so I kind of figured, all right, I'll just pay someone to do this because if any dirt's in the system and Honda Data decides they want to you know, void the warranty, I can always go to the source who did the installation and be like, hey, I need $3,000 to go buy a new fuel system because your installation wasn't good. But something that we will be doing, instead of doing like a tutorial on how to install it, I'm actually gonna film with Stratton Motor Cars and we're gonna talk about what it was like to install it and things that you should look out for in case you wanna do this yourself. I will tell you this, they had never installed it onto this car before and it took them about 10 hours. They weren't billing me based on expected hours, they're just billing me based on actual hours. The main thing that I think took them the longest was you have to remove the intake manifold from the rear of the engine block, pull it out so you can change out the injectors because the injectors are on the bottom side. So they just went ahead and removed that. Um, we'll go over that in future videos and then we're gonna talk about what it feels like to drive it and all that other crazy stuff. So once the vinyl wrap is completed and I have the car back, I'm gonna be doing another retune with Red Star Motoring. Um, I think we will either do a dyno tune or another street tune. It depends on if I can get access to a dyno. You know, during the pandemic and stuff, I've, I was expecting to do more dynos with it. I just haven't had access to one and uh, you know, whatever. Street tunes work just as good, um, but I will definitely get a dyno tune eventually. Um, but we, we're just gonna go through it and make sure that everything's running good because I believe once that Honda Data fuel system is in there, we can actually run E50 blends, which is perfect for me because most of the E85 stations where I live only have like E54. So, you know, that's fine. There's no real E85 around me. There's like one or two stations that are like 50 miles away that do. That's just not practical for me. So I can't wait 
to make that video, giving my impressions of it before and after, you know, the Honda fuel system and the flex fuel and all that other crazy stuff. After that, there's not really much else to do to the Civic Type R beyond a turbo upgrade, which I'm waiting for PRL Motorsports to come out with it because it's gonna be a direct replacement. There's already other turbo upgrades out there, but they're not direct replacement, meaning you gotta buy all kinds of new piping and stuff like that. And I'm not looking to set any track records or anything. I'm just looking to take my car to that limit of what can the stock internals handle, what can the stock clutch handle, and then toning it back a few notches for reliability. Um, beyond that, I don't want to take the car any higher than that. If I want to go faster, I'll buy another car, which brings me to my next point of buying a Nissan GTR. So if you follow me on Instagram, I've been talking about kind of torn between the GTR in the new 2020 GT500s. I think they're both phenomenal cars. It was about a 50-50 mix on GTR versus GT500. Like literally 50% of the audience wants a GTR, the other 50% wants a GT500. So let's talk about the GT500 real quick, then we'll talk about the GTR. So on the GT500s, base price for one with you know regular seats in it, doesn't have Recaro's, $79,000, $80,000. Most of the cars come with their technology package, which is another three grand, so about 83 grand. If you get it with the Recaro seats, you're looking at an $85,000 MSRP, which would be the one that I would want. I would want the one with the Recaro seats and the technology package. Beyond that, you can get the carbon fiber track pack, which is an additional 18 grand. Takes it up to like 100, 105,000. Now that's great, that's a fantastic price. Problem is you can't get them for that price. The most affordable is a base model with regular seats, no Recaros in it. It did have the technology package. They wanted $102,000 for it. In my humble opinion, that's not worth the money. And the same thing's happening for the Corvette C8s. You know, unless you got your order in really early, you're not gonna get those for less than 20 grand over sticker. What I think is gonna happen is they might be worth the money right now because people are paying more for the used than they are for the new, but eventually it's like a housing bubble almost. It's gonna crash one day and people are gonna be upside down in their cars. So because of that, I don't wanna pay an artificial price for something. I don't mind paying MSRP. I don't mind if the dealership makes money. That's why they're in business. But I don't wanna just hand them over 25 to $40,000 just because. You know what I mean? That's just kind of like, why would I? So with the Nissan GTR, Nissan GTR's base price is about $116,000. You know, there's not really any options you can get on a GTR unless you go to a different trim level. So the track edition and the Nismo, I don't think are worth the money because you can get a standard premium base model and tune it and it'll be faster than both. So for the past week, I've been looking at a brand new 2020 GTR off the showroom floor and I've been looking at a 2019 that has 9,600 miles on it. And the 2019 cost 96 grand. The brand new one cost 110,000. So the first one I started looking at was the 2019 for $96,000. I was like, hey, I could save $14,000. That'd be kind of cool. And so I went to the dealership and I took did a little walk around and I was doing the walk around on it. And a few things, I, I, look, at the, I look at red flags that people say. So the manager of the dealership came up to me and he goes, oh yeah, you can tell that the previous owner really took care of it. And I'm kind of looking at it like it has a shitload of rock chips on the front. Now the rock chips were touched up. They weren't touched up correctly, but they were touched up. No one did any sanding or any polishing on them. I can do a rock chip and make it disappear almost. These, they, they disappeared because the car is white. So that's why I wanted a white one. You don't see scratches or dirt on them very much, but they didn't touch them up correctly, but that wasn't a big issue. I then went around and I used a quarter because I didn't have a depth gauge and I just tested the depth of the tires because the tires are $547 a piece. Rear tires were good, front tires were shot. The manager of the dealership, oh yeah, we just put a new set of tires on it. And I was like, really? Cause the front tires are gone. And then he reached down, put his finger in the treads. He's like, you're right. I don't know how that got missed. We will put a new set of tires on it for you. And I was like, all right, cool. I then went under the engine bay. I pulled the dipstick. The oil was completely dirty. Now, previous to this, the manager told me they did a complete service on this car, but they didn't even change the oil. So I'm starting to kind of mistrust them a little bit. It could have been that he ordered for it to be serviced and it didn't happen, 
but nonetheless, what he was saying wasn't aligning with reality. But I thought that was cool, you know, that he said they would, you know, make sure they change all the fluids. They would also make sure that it had a brand new set of tires on it before I drove it away. And I was like, well, I'm glad you said you would do that. Now, the downside to this dealership is they're one of those, what they call no haggle dealerships. It's actually a Mercedes dealership. Um, a lot of dealerships are doing this now where they don't want to negotiate the price on used cars, but they will on new cars. And I think that's kind of stupid. So I continued to do my walk around of the car. I walked around the exterior. The body lines were all tight and they fit good. There was no paint chips between the body lines. Overall, from the exterior, you know, it looked like, aside from rock chips, it was in great condition. I looked at the brakes to make sure that they weren't cracking and they were good. Then went to the interior of the car. The interior was in great shape. Now, one thing that was bugging me was it was missing the OEM floor mats and whoever owned it put these ugly, hideous floor mats in it that were this bright red and they had those stupid diamond stitching. I'll, I actually have a photo from the dealership I'll show you. I thought they were just ridiculous. I was like, oh my God. And if you look up how much OEM floor mats are, they're like 250 bucks. So I, I even said like, yeah, I would like OEM. And they agreed, they said, yeah, we'll order you some OEM floor mats. And I'm like, wow, these people are like really helpful. So what that tells me is they're not willing to negotiate price, but they have a lot of wiggle room in the price to fix stuff. Aside from the floor mats on the interior, um, there was no burn marks, but it had a really big smell of someone smoking inside of it. Now, I used to be a smoker. I used to smoke in cars. However, even back when I was a smoker, I wouldn't smoke in a $110,000 GTR. I just wouldn't. That's just me though. I, and so to me, that tells me whoever owned it just didn't care about the car. If they were the kind of person that would smoke in the car, they're probably also the kind of person that would skip service, which we're going to cover something in a minute about service and what you should look for when you're looking at buying a used GTR. Um, because I had pre-approval, they let me test drive the car. Most dealerships won't let you test drive GTRs and stuff because people break them. But I took it on a test drive. Transmission felt strong. The, the engine felt strong. What didn't feel right was the suspension. I'm assuming that either A, the alignment was off, but it didn't feel off because it would drive straight when I wasn't touching the wheel or something with the front suspension was messed up because when I was going around corners, I felt like I could lose control of the car at any time. And that was kind of spooky because in my Type R, I can take a corner at 95 miles an hour and have 100% confidence in it. Being an all wheel drive car, you would think that you would have that kind of confidence. And based on other people's reviews, they said that they had confidence in them. Now I've never driven a GTR, but I knew that just didn't feel right. We got back to the dealership and I then asked them, can I see the service records for it? Because they said that they had all the history of the car. And I'm going through the service records, saw that two people had owned it. The first person that had it was a lease. And the second person only had it for 5,000 miles and then got rid of it. So that tells me that either A, the first person that had a lease, leased cars are driven basically like rental cars because they're gonna give them back and they don't care if they break it because warranty. So that's one thing that sucks. And then the second thing is why would someone keep a car for 5,000 miles and just get rid of it to take the depreciation hit? That didn't make sense to me. Um, don't get me wrong, people do it, but those were kind of red flags to me. So then I'm going through the service history and there's no service history of it prior to 2,700 miles. Now, here's something that you guys should know about GTRs. GTRs have a pretty strict break-in period. Um, people kind of argue about it a little bit, but in the manual it says not to take it above a certain RPM, and it tells you how to drive it for the first 1,000 miles, and then at the 1,000 mile mark, you're supposed to take it back to the dealership to get its 1,000 mile service. And what they do is they pull the computer logs and they can tell if the car was broken in properly. Number two, what they do, they tune the transmission and the clutches and they adjust everything. And number three, they make sure the motor is balanced and both sides of the engine are harmonious with one another. They just go through the vehicle and tighten up anything that may have come loose and adjust it for your driving style. Now, if you do not have a record for that, if you're looking at a used GTR, run away immediately. Reason I say that is if it wasn't broken in properly, that determines how long your car is gonna last, especially the transmission. And if a transmission goes out, they don't fix them. It's a $20,000 replacement. So in my head, I'm sitting here thinking I can go buy a brand new one for $110,000 or I can buy a used one for 96, and if the trans goes out, I spent $116,000 on it. Now, obviously, if I was gonna consider buying this car, I would do something called a pre-purchase inspection, and that's where you have the seller take it to a Nissan dealership or whatever dealership 
for the car that you're buying. And I would pay two to $300 to the dealership to inspect it. And what they will do on that is they'll pull the ECU readings. Um, the one thing you wanna look at on the GTR is you know the temps that the transmission got taken up to. On the Nissan GTR, the normal driving temps for the transmission are, are about 185 to 190 degrees Fahrenheit. On the track, the average temperature is about 242 degrees Fahrenheit. So when you take it in for a PPI, you can actually tell if the car has ever been tracked by looking at the transmission temps. So if you see anything between 190 degrees and 242 degrees, it's probably been tracked. Another thing to keep in mind is if you see the transmission temps exceed 242 degrees, they probably broke some teeth off of the, some of the gears and you're probably gonna have problems in the future. So I would obviously do that, but not having that very first thousand mile service just ruined it for me. I mean, I would pay them 70 grand for the car, but I'm not gonna pay them 96,000 for the car. And because they don't negotiate price, I just kindly told them, no, thank you. I will go buy the brand new one. Now for the brand new GTR, I don't think it has any miles on it, maybe five miles on it. It's sitting in the showroom floor. I am approved for it, but it really determines if we can get the terms of the sale correct. Um, right now they approve me and they want me to put $15,000 down. Personally, I only want to put $10,000 down because I have some other bills that I need to take care of. It's not that I can't afford it. It's just what I'm willing to pay. And the reason that it might be a little bit of a stretch to get them to say yes to 10 K down is the bank approved me for a certain amount of a loan to reduce the down payment means they have to reduce the price of the car from 110 K to 105 K, which is absolute bottom price that you can get for a GTR on a Nissan GTR. The invoice price is about $108,000. Well, every, invoice price has what's called a holdback. On this car, it happens to be a $3,000 holdback. Holdback is a way that a dealership can pay, sell the car for invoice, and then Nissan corporate will pay that dealership a certain fee just for selling the car. So in this case, if they sold it for invoice, the dealership would make three grand. That's why dealerships are able to say, oh, we're gonna sell it to you at employee discount. Like they're still making money, which is fine. I'm all about dealerships making money because they got to stay in business. But as of right now, my wife and I have made the decision that if they want to approve it at $10,000 down, then we will buy it. And if not, I'm going to save my money. We're going to save up some more money and I'll either put 50% down or I'll just buy the car and write a check for it. So I'm not 100% um, certain on you know what we're going to be doing moving forward, but if they'll agree to it, we'll buy it. Uh, the GTR has been a car that I've wanted since the day it came out in 2009. Now, I don't classify myself as a fanboy because I understand that the car has limitations. It's not the fastest thing on the street. I get that. It's not about that for me. I don't care about being the fastest. It's about the experience. And it's a car that I told myself in 2009, I wanted to go to medical school to become a surgeon. And I said, one day when I become a surgeon, that's going to be the car that I buy. Now I'm not a surgeon now I'm a YouTuber, but, but even though I'm a YouTuber, I'm still going to keep that promise to myself. And this will be a car that I plan on keeping for the rest of my life. Now there will be other cars that I'll buy in the future as you know, I get things paid off. And as I'm able to develop my income into higher pay grades and stuff, I'll buy other cars, but this is just a car that I've wanted for 11 years. So that's the situation on where the channel's going, where the Type R is. More Type R content is coming. I've got a bunch of stuff planned, um, and even more than what I mentioned earlier for it. And then that's how things are going between the GT500 and the GTR. I'm definitely going to get a GTR, just don't know when or, you know, depending on how the deal goes. But let me know down in the comments section. I would like to know, spending your own money, enough money, what car would you buy? And, and why, why would that car? I'd like to know because I love hearing everybody's um, perspectives and things like that. So let's just make up a number. If you made $400,000 a year, let's just say that. What car would you buy? But anyways, guys, I love you. I'm excited to get into this next car build. I'm excited to finish up the Type R and I'm excited to see where we can take this channel. Thank you guys for subscribing. But until next time, I love you. You guys stay sexy.